Well, hi, I'm Mike Coburn, Research America's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. And welcome back to the National Health Research Forum. Are you enjoying today's program? Um, well, you know what? We host these member-only programs year-round. And if you're not a member, you can learn more about Research America by visiting the Research America booth in the exhibit hall. Also, <clears throat> follow us on Twitter today with the hashtag RAForum. We have a lot of Twitter followers and, and please spread the word through Twitter. So next in our series of Science on the Front Lines is a conversation with Dr. Robert Redford, the Director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and Frank Sesno, the Director for Strategic Initiatives at the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And so Frank, over to you. Well, Mike, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all at Research America for making this incredible forum possible. And Dr. Redfield, welcome to you. Before we get started, first, thank you for um, all your work and for all your efforts on behalf of everyone's health in this country. Welcome, and we do appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Glad to be here, and thank Research of America. Um, Dr. Redfield, I want to start with vaccines, right? The very, very important thing, the timeline, the challenges ahead. And let me start with um, something that people may have seen and may have caused some concern given all the qualms about vaccines uh, in the public anyway, or relative qualms. Uh, what should we make of AstraZeneca's decision to put on hold its global trials of what it seemed a promising vaccine because of what they identified as a suspected serious adverse reaction in a participant um, in, that, in that trial in the United Kingdom? You know, Frank, thank you for asking. First and foremost, I think what that does is underscore what many of us have been saying, that there's no shortcuts when it comes to safety when we're developing these vaccines. The real shortcut that we're taking is obviously the financial risk. So it's very standard when we're doing these trials that when you have an adverse reaction that is deemed to be serious, as this one was, that the trial is put on hold while the Data Safety Monitoring Board has the opportunity to critically evaluate uh, this adverse reaction. Now, we don't know what's the adverse reaction associated with the vaccine or placebo, but we do know that one of the volunteers did have what was judged by the investigators, a serious adverse reaction report uh, occurring. And so then that led uh, the uh, sponsor, AstraZeneca, to go ahead and put the trial on hold while this is further investigated. To the best of your knowledge, has anything like this happened in other trials? Uh, not of the ones that are ongoing right now, but yes. I mean, I've conducted a number of clinical trials in my days, both at Walter Reed and University of Maryland, of which I had the trial put on hold because of adverse reactions until we could evaluate whether that adverse reaction was something that was associated with the investigational product. And if so, was it uh, serious enough that we then had to uh, stop the trial, or in many cases, uh, serious enough that we would then stagger our enrollment and watch to see if there's additional results. I think for the American public, what I'd like to have them take away from this and the global public is that safety is paramount here, that these vaccines are going to be developed and they're going to be evaluated critically for safety. And if there's a safety signal, we're going to basically slow down and take a look at this to make sure uh, that uh, we stay in that climate, that safety is the number one objective of all these initial trials. So, so let me ask the question this way then. You, CDC sent guidance not very long ago about a vaccine A and a vaccine B to sell to state health agencies. Pfizer had said it was on track for a government review, perhaps in early October for its vaccine. Moderna had talked about a phase three trial in September, AstraZeneca before this was in phase three talked about vaccine in October. So against this backdrop and what just happened with AstraZeneca, what's your best estimate for when a safe vaccine will be available? Well, I think one thing I've learned is, uh, you know, that as CDC director, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the opinion, opinion business. You know, I'm really in the data and the science of it. Okay, well, when does the data and science suggest Yeah, that? I can tell you that based on the enrollment right now that's going on with the Pfizer and the Moderna, that it's conceptual that they will have enough data to uh, present it to the FDA for evaluation somewhere before the end of October and the end of November. 
The reason I can't be more specific because these trials are what we call event-driven trials. So they're really 100% dependent on how much COVID occurs in the volunteer population. So if it's a, a lot of these individuals happen to get COVID, independent of what group they're in, we just the total number of events, then the potential for them to have enough events if the vaccine is very, very efficacious will be in the October timeframe. If the vaccine is 50% efficacious, it might be in the late November timeframe. If there's fewer events and it's a very good vaccine, it might be in the late November, December timeframe. So I think we all, I think, can say that somewhere between the end of October and, and the end of the year, it's probable that one or more of these vaccines will be presented to the FDA for review, either for an emergency authorization or potentially for approval. So by that timeline, when would, what would be the time range when we'd actually start seeing vaccinations be deployed? So because Project Warp Speed, as I said, it's not taking shortcuts on safety or scientific integrity. As we sit here today, those vaccines from Moderna and, and Pfizer and AstraZeneca are actually being made for use to be distributed if the FDA can determine that they're safe and efficacious. Normally what would happen is you'd have to wait till the FDA reviews the data. They would say the vaccine's safe and efficacious. Then the pharmaceutical company would begin to figure out how to manufacture it, and it would have a six month to a year lag. This vaccine is going to be available. It's either going to be a bunch of souvenirs if the vaccine doesn't show to be safe or efficacious. But again, to save that time, and really it's important time, particularly for those of us that have comorbidities that are over the age of 65, you know, the sooner that we can have a preventive vaccine for COVID, uh, it will translate to saving human life. So there was an acceleration to make sure there wasn't an administrative delay just because of the financial dynamics of how we develop vaccines. So that's what's really remarkable about Operation Warp Speed. It's not that we're taking a safety, a safety uh, shortcut, like I just said with the AstraZeneca trial going on hold is a good example. It's not that we're taking scientific principle shortcut, but we are taking a, a, a financial one. When you ask me when do we think the vaccine will be available broadly to the American public, uh, if everything goes really well, that will be sometime in the first, second quarter of 2021. But for those high risk prioritized individuals, uh, it's conceptual that vaccine could be available in the late fall, early winter of this year. Let me ask you this, because what's so important about vaccines too is public acceptance so that people get vaccinated. Um, we've got a disinformation campaign that long before COVID was stirring up anti-vax concerns. And there have been surveys with respect to a COVID vaccine that show significant hesit hesitancy to get one. Um, the politics of this election cycle have raised concerns that Operation Warp Speed could be a rush, at least among some, you know that that's out there. President uh, has said the vaccine could be available before election day. Some say that the CDC has been subject to political pressures. With all of these headwinds, <laughs> and that's being polite to call them headwinds, how do you convince a skeptical and divided public that a vaccine, when it comes out, is safe? Yeah, this is really important. I mean, one of the goals that I've had as CDC director is to move away from what we call vaccine hesitancy to a culture in our nation of vaccination with confidence. You know, when we, when we find that less than 50% of the American public takes the flu vaccine, and I tell you that in the last decade, 360,000 people died of flu, and we actually have a vaccine, then how do we begin to get the American public to embrace vaccine? Don't leave what is one of the most important contributions of science, the modern medicine, that's vaccination. And so many people still leave that on the shelf for themselves, their family, their community. So, we are trying to build that, that advocacy, but it's, it's a long journey because a lot of, I mean, let's take non-COVID vaccines, but a lot of parents, you know, the reason they are hesitant to vaccinate is they just don't want to make a mistake for their children. 
I had six children. And so it is going to take time for the healthcare professionals to sit down and have a dialogue about this, maybe several times before parents embrace vaccines. A lot of times doctors will ask you, do you want to get a vaccine? You say no, and that's the end of the story. I'm asking the doctors and nurses, nurse practitioners, PA to re-engage in that discussion. Some are misinformed. And when someone's misinformed, you can't just say, oh, you're misinformed, you don't know what you're talking about. You've got to engage them in a dialogue and try to get them to understand so they can come to their own conclusion that they're misinformed. So this vaccine hesitancy is really a serious issue. I'm actually very concerned about it now, particularly with the COVID vaccine. It's not something that should be politicized. Well, so have you said to the President of the United States, please don't politicize this. Please don't use this in your speeches or to the other candidates for that matter, that you've got to have everybody around a vaccine and this cannot be an issue of politics? Again, in my comments with the president, I keep to myself and the president, but I will say publicly here what I just said, this cannot be politicized by e either party uh, or any individual. I mean, but hasn't he done that when he has said there could be a vaccine by election day? Once you instill fear in somebody, it's very hard to remove that. So I have a challenge right now that I'm working on, which is called disparity of vaccination, right? Let's just take the flu vaccine, for example. Only 28% in 2017, 18 of Hispanic Latino Americans took the flu vaccine. Now I'm very glad we got it up in a year, up into the high 30s, but that's still only the high 30s. The African American community, we went from say about 41% to about 47, 48%. I don't need to reinforce hesitancy. And so on either side, and again, not picking sides, either side that politicizes this, again, is working against the goal for that, what I'm trying to accomplish, which is to get American culture to be of a point of view to vaccinate with confidence. You know, we have some schools in this country where less than 30% of the kids are vaccinated against measles. That's why we saw the big measles outbreak two years ago. So this is really important and the added concern when this, people do view that this vaccine is being rushed, that may impact safety. I'm trying again to tell you that I know that from CDC's point of view, I can tell you from NIH's point of view, I can tell you from the FDA's point of view, that the only thing that's gonna dictate this process is data and science. And we would like to have us be able to continue to do that Obviously, the pharmaceutical companies have also made a recent commitment that, that, that they're in line with that whole concept. Uh, we should celebrate when we have a successful, safe, and efficacious COVID virus vaccine. I didn't think we'd have one for a couple of years. I thought the rest of my CDC career was going to be knee-deep in a war against COVID. Now I can see if we can get a, an efficacious vaccine or two or three, that actually between now and next summer, we can get this behind us. Oh, I, that, those are important words. Get this behind us. I think we'll, we'll take you to take, take your science and medicine. Uh, I hope it, at, at its word there. Before we get to next summer, though, we got to get through this fall and winter. And so I want to ask you about the, the fall winter seasonal flu and how that collides with, with COVID-19. What's your assessment of the coming flu season and what that means given the pandemic? You know, Frank, I, I, I made a couple news cycles back in April when I I commented that I thought that, that the October, November, December could be the worst public health fall that this nation's ever had. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it, it, I think, could have been. I don't, I'm hopeful that it's not going to be because with the confluence of flu and, and COVID, we almost, you know, in a bad flu season, there's some hospital systems that are overwhelmed. Right. You saw what happened to a bad COVID in the Northeast. It overwhelmed the hospitals there and on Chicago, Detroit, and, and Los Angeles, and down in New Orleans. Um, but I'm going to tell you, it's very interesting what we're seeing. You know, flu actually transmits all year round. We actually peak in the late fall, winter. That's what we call flu season, the respiratory virus. Season. But the truth is, flu is transmitted in this country all year round. And we have, we have now the lowest spring, summer transmission of flu that we've ever seen. Now, why is that? Well, you know what blocks flu transmission? 
masks, masks, social distancing, hand washing, okay, being smart about crowds. So the same things that we're now doing for COVID and our colleagues down south in Australia and others have seen the mildest flu season they've ever had. So I do believe that if the American public does five things for me, wear a mask when they can't social distance, social distance, vigilant about hand hygiene, be smart about crowds, you know, indoors worse than outdoor. Outdoor things, you know, do that more than indoor. And indoor, stay away from crowds, right? And the last thing I want them to do, the fifth thing, is get vaccinated against flu. We do those five things, and there's a good chance. And what I appeal to individuals who haven't had a vaccine for flu before is one of the things the flu vaccine does well, it may not prevent infection, but it does modify illness. So if you and I can get our flu vaccine, so if and when we do get flu, we don't end up in the hospital taking the bed from what that 72 year old woman with COVID needs, so the doctors and nurses aren't overwhelmed, then we're doing our part in this outbreak. So let me, let me tell, it, tell you a story. I was talking to somebody just the other day who just flew across the country and had to stop over in Atlanta and walk through Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta and told me that it was crowded and that there were people not wearing masks or people wearing their masks over their mouths but not over their noses, so not properly. And he was very concerned about that. How concerned should we be that COVID fatigue or just you know, sort of asserting your freedom or whatever you wanna call it is gonna make those five things even after all this insistence that you and others have had on these points, harder to do as we go into this seasonal flu season? Well, I think you've hit a big issue. I mean, I was in Hartsfield a couple of weeks ago and I think I only observed a few people uh, without masks, but there are plenty of places in this country where people still haven't fully embraced, particularly the young group between 18 and 25, uh, haven't embraced the importance of what I just told you. And again, we can only continue to try to appeal to people to, you know, I always quote the John Kennedy quote, you know, don't ask what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. What I'm asking the American public to do is become a warrior in the pandemic, all right? Do those five things, we'll bring this outbreak to an end. Okay, let me, let me ask you about um, another aspect of, of this, which is also very important. We talk about health disparities a lot, and you mentioned minority populations. What has the CDC done to ensure that the supply of vaccines when it comes is sufficient and that the vaccines and the promotion of those vaccines to minority communities, which have been so hard hit, will get the attention that it deserves? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that we're working very hard on now, as you know, is to prepare for the distribution of this vaccine. So you heard the National Academy came out with some of their recommendations. We have the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that will ultimately take all the data and they'll come out and they'll set up the prioritization of where they recommend this vaccine be used. And initially the vaccine is going to be in short supply. So it's got to be prioritized. And we're in the process of putting that <clears throat> together. Then that, 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 that vaccine, once it's prioritized, it's going to have to be distributed. So we've gone out to the initial five jurisdictions and worked with four of the states in one major city to actually work on their what we call micro distribution plan. And by the end of this month, we'll have put those plans to be developed in all of the jurisdictions across the country. Because ultimately we've got to get prepared uh, for that uh, distribution. Uh, one of the reasons- Will, will, that, will, will, that, will that distribution, if I may, will that distribution in recognizing the disparities of this illness, prioritize distribution among those communities hardest hit? I think that's gonna be uh, obviously one of the key priorities. Um, ultimately, that recommendation is gonna come from the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices. Well, what is your, what is your Well, I think there's two major issues right now. There's the group that's at risk for infection, usually occupationally, and then there's a, the group that's risk for a bad outcome if they do get infected. And that's where we're seeing the elderly, that's where we're seeing some of the minority populations. It's not that they're more 
necessarily a risk of infection, but they are a greater risk if they do get infected because of comorbidities of a, of a bad outcome. This is why I'm not excited and I'm very actually I like to fight back about anybody that says things to develop fear in individuals, particularly in minority populations, about potentially taking the vaccine. You know, because then you have a process where we have a vaccine and we want to distribute to groups that we think are at, worst, at risk for bad outcomes. But if there's a selective decision by one group or another not to take the vaccine. So we're working hard right now. We have programs that we're working in partnership with the flu vaccine, with the African-American community and Hispanic community to try to increase uptake. As I mentioned to you, it's still not over 50% in those communities. We've made a lot of progress in the last year, but we have a long way to go. We're still under 50%. Um, but I do think it's really important to build confidence uh, in everyone, particularly in the African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Native American population to embrace this vaccine when it comes on. Uh, clearly, they're going to be a prioritization, and that prioritization will either be by, are you an uh, intensive care unit doctor or high-risk individual? Or are you someone at high risk for a bad outcome? I think those will be the two priorities. And depending on how much vaccines are originally available, uh, it will be prioritized along that. It probably won't be till after the first of the year that we have enough vaccine to have broader availability to the broader American public. The first, the first uh, you know, 50 million doses are gonna be prioritized for those two populations based on outcome or based on risk of let me turn to testing for a minute. You know, rightly or wrongly, that the, some of the CDC guidelines, as they've been expressed, especially recently, have proved very controversial. Um, and there are those who say that what the CDC is advocating is that fewer tests are actually better. Uh, right? Wrong? What, would, what, do you, what do you say to this? Yeah, what I is the CDC? Really not, absolutely not wrong. Testing is a critical part of our public health strategy. What the CDC was saying, although unfortunately it wasn't reported with uh, correctly, was we were saying that we wanted to place emphasis on testing individuals that have symptomatic illness or individuals that had significant exposure, so they could be asymptomatic, or vulnerable populations, like nursing homes, they could be asymptomatic, or critical care, uh, critical infrastructure workers or healthcare workers, first responders, all of which could be asymptomatic. And lastly, we said, for individuals who may be asymptomatic, but it was prioritized by a doctor or public health person. What we were trying to do is get testing to drive action for a specific public health objective, to bring it back from the, I was, we are seeing way too many people on the way to work, stop by a drive-through, get tested, and then only finding out about the results five, six, seven days later. That's not actionable testing. So it was unfortunate that one of the networks said that we recommended against testing asymptomatic. We did not. The first sentence said, you may not need to be tested if you're asymptomatic. Second sentence, we wanted you to engage your doctor or public health person. So we're still trying to get that focused. I'm glad you brought it up here. Testing is a critical part of our public health strategy. Asymptomatic testing is a critical part of our public health strategy. We just want to do it in a way that's actionable. All right, well, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this follow-up to this because it's so important. When that guidance came out, however it was reported, there was not just you know, noise in the media, which there was, mm -hmm. but there was also noise in the political Everywhere. Uh, atmosphere, we'll call it. And Governor Andrew Cuomo said, and I'm quoting here, we're not going to follow the CDC guidance I consider it political propaganda, his words. So hardly surprising that the public is confused and angry or whatever. So what do you need to do? What are you doing at the CDC to inspire confidence, to clarify this, to make people understand that, that you are independent, pushing back against politics and just trying to follow science to keep people healthy? Well, the first thing we did literally, literally minutes after CNN reported it incorrectly is we issued a CDC statement on guidance, which I clearly said everything I just told you. Unfortunately, that didn't seem to make the news cycle, uh, where we basically said testing was meant to drive action for public health objectives. 
you know, we said that everyone who needs a test is going to get it. Everyone who wants one may not necessarily need it. The key is to engage the public health community. But it wasn't and just it, media. I just, I just read you Governor Cuomo's words. So I know. And, and of course, I called my good friend uh, Howard Zucker, who's the state health department, and explained everything to him. Um, but unfortunately, you hit another head. A lot of people have chosen, okay, to try to politicize. And I can just tell you that CDC is a data-driven, science-based service organization. I'm a clinician, clinical researcher, public health person. I'm not a politician. My friend Steve Hahn at FDA is a great oncologist, not a politician. Um, and you know, it's disappointing for those of us that have decided to serve uh, that people want to assume uh, our decision-making process is somehow influenced by politics. I can only tell people that I know for myself and I know for Steve Hahn uh, that it's not influenced by politics. That saying that not going to change people who've already decided that they want to decide it one way or the other. I mean, this is a, you know, I mean, there are people from both sides of the political spectrum that want to try to suggest that these organizations are making decisions politically. I can only continue to try to lead 23,000 dedicated men and women to public health in this nation. And we're gonna use our best effort to do the work we can uh, to put science and data into action, to try to improve the public health and the human condition of this nation. And, you know, I'm, I can't wait till we're out of the political season uh, because maybe then we can get back, but I can only tell you that politi politics is not entered in the public health decisions that we've made. There are many people that try to suggest, I mean, take an example, you talked about vaccines. My team and I wrote a letter that wanted the states to be prepared to deliver the vaccine, right? And all of a sudden, because we wrote that letter, asking, knowing that we might have vaccine by November, to please get ready to be prepared, people then assumed that that was a political. No, we're asking states to get prepared. More, if you want to do a critical uh, problem for credibility for CDC, it would be for the Project Workbeat to have 50 million doses of vaccine and we don't know how to deliver it. That would be something that we would then, and so that's what we're doing, but immediately some people want to suggest that because we're asking states to be prepared, that somehow that's a political statement. But again, all the words that I say is not going to convince people. We're going to continue to stay focused. I, I sort of, uh, in closing this, I, I, I constantly read every morning uh, a quote over my desk, which is the quote from Teddy Roosevelt saying, never mind the critic. You know, the credit goes, and I paraphrase, the man or woman that's in the arena, all right. bloody and marred. And let me tell you, I understand what that means to be bloody and marred. And we try, we come up short. We try, we come up short. But at the end of the day, we either know the triumph of high achievement, or if we fail, we fail by daring greatly. That's the mode we're in. We're gonna continue, or CDC is gonna to continue to do what we think is in the best interest of the American public to improve the human conditions. And more importantly, and you're gonna probably ask a question or two about this, trying to keep the agency to make sure one of the casualties of COVID is in our program on the war of opioids. Well, I guess. Uh, in the AIDS epidemic. It's not our program that we're trying to improve. You know, 700 women died last year delivering ba uh, their babies. We shouldn't have maternal mortality like that. You know, we're looking what's happening to suicide and mental health. Uh, we, we have really important programs here that can't go on autopilot. You know, and I've tried to keep my men and women at CDC enthusiastic about their job. I think if the one thing that I, I can take bad press, I can take criticism, but it hurts me when I see the men and women dedicating their lives read stuff that isn't true, but they may not be equipped to understand it as well, and it modulates their enthusiasm, right? And, and, and therefore they begin to be less enthusiastic about their work. They're not oh, used I, to it. I, I, and it's really one of the real, I, I, I hope when reporters uh, write stuff, they realize they can either motivate the American public or they can, Demotivate them. I, I would just, I, I completely agree with you. I, but I just want to say for the, for the fulsomeness of the conversation, that advice it should not just, and maybe not even primarily go to journalists and reporters, although it certainly belongs there because there's a lot that can be done, but also to 
political leaders and people Absolutely. who have the public stage who also politicize this and sometimes take the first steps to that. I mean, if, if we, we should be listening to you, the doctors, and you should be told that you, the science, the medicine, always must come first because this is about public safety, not public opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you raised the, the opioid issue, and I really want to get to that before our, our time runs out, because while COVID is such an urgent crisis, there are so many other crises with which we are dealing with, which I know you're dealing with and that you feel passionate about. COVID has crowded out sort of the public focus on the op opioid crisis in, in too many ways. Wall Street Journal recently, uh, just recently collected data across the country and found um, counties nationwide are experiencing a rise in opioid deaths this year after more than 70 deaths last year, which was a, a record. How, in your view, has COVID complicated the opioid crisis and efforts to combat it? Well, I think, Frank, at the, at the very beginning was, uh, and if you could go back, was the lack of a surgical approach to how we limited medical care. Right. Clearly, there was an attempt not to do complicated surgeries that were going to put people in intensive care units when we thought we might run out of intensive care unit beds. But that didn't mean to shut down mental health services. Right. Okay. It didn't mean to shut down daily opioid treatment programs. Right. And, and, and there was a very non-surgical approach to this, as you know. And so there was a huge loss in access I think, to quality medical care. Either you believe, if you have a drug use disorder, that your interactions with the medical profession has a positive value, or you don't. And to shut that off, I think, was really unfortunate. So now, up against COVID, what, how, do you, how do you regain the offensive on this? Well, I think that we're now trying to get that back. As you said, we've, we've, we've had a significant increase. We've had almost a 17 18% increase in this. Uh, subjected uh, overdose uh, submissions. You know, we've had an increase in suicide. We've had an increase in um, uh, stress disorder. Uh, so we're trying to get those services back up and running. Uh, you mean, when I say we, I mean the medical community at large. We're trying to highlight the importance of it. I mean, CDC recently did a survey and we found 31% of US adults now have uh, uh, expressed, uh, you know, anxiety and depressive disorder. Uh, and uh, almost 26% had trauma or stress disorder. I mean, there's a huge mental psychological consequence right. that happens on this. It's personal to me. I think you know that. You said that. I almost lost one of my six sons, children, uh, who almost died from contaminated uh, cocaine with fentanyl. I'm proud to say uh, he's now in his fifth year of recovery. It's a real struggle. I know what it's like. I thought I knew uh, drug use disorder. I was a physician for 22 years in Baltimore. I had many patients with drug use disorder. Until it came into my own family, I had no concept of what drug use disorder did. You know, it's a chronic relapsing medical condition. We need to treat it as such. And the fact that all of that treatment got cut off is a price. We're trying to get it back. Uh, it's important. It's, you can say the same thing about what's happened to particularly young adults, say between the age of 20 and 50 and suicide. Uh, again, another another uh, situation that requires you know medical intervention. Um, so it's important to get get uh, get those individuals back into care and treatment to have them have confidence in it. Um, you know, a lot of people with chronic pain disorder. They couldn't get treatment for their chronic pain disorder, went back to self-medicating. Self-medicating led to drug overdoses. I think when we really look back at the, at the casualties that occurred in our response, that's the issue. You know, we as doctors always say, do no harm. That's our big issue, do no harm. You know, I personally believe there was harm in closing all of our K through 12 schools. I'm glad we're trying to get them back open now safely. There was harm in, maybe indiscriminately shutting, shutting down all medical care. Uh, so getting back now to making sure we prioritize the medical care that individuals need, make sure we get it back, make sure we get back education, K-12, so these kids can get educated properly, working to do it again safely and smartly. I'm not advocating to be blind about it. You gotta be safe and smart. But I think, you know, 
we did lose ground in opioids, and now we got to work hard to make it up. Well, Dr. Redfield, I, on behalf of everybody in this gathering and beyond, I wish you luck on that. Um, thank you for all that you do and, and um, for your comments about how science and medicine and public health should drive uh, everything that we're doing now. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your candor and um, all the best in your battle against COVID and opioid and all the other things that, that afflict Americans. You're a doctor and you're doing a lot more than trying to do no harm. So many thanks. Well, thank you very much, Frank. God bless you. All right. Thanks to you. And back over to, to Mike Coburn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Redfield and Frank, for a timely and important conversation. Um, <clears throat> really appreciate your time with us today. So now Thanks. let's take a short break uh, until 3 p.m. Eastern time uh, when we'll have a personal and powerful perspective from a patient advocate. Uh, and a reminder as the session closes out, please return to the lobby to join the next session. And if some reason you close the lobby out, you can go back to the original login screen and, and get reoriented and back into the auditorium for three o'clock. So we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>